All right, so now we've uh, you know hopefully gotten everybody on board with the with the, the setup of the problem and the and the necessary background, and uh, now we can we can get to the the payoff here. So we'll look at some actual attempts to to estimate the the states. So remember what we're doing: you're looking at observations in the magnetic field. Uh, and trying to estimate the, the state of the outer core of the planet, the fluid flow and, and the magnetic field in the, in the deep interior and use that to make, make forecasts on decadal scales. All right, so uh, this is something maybe I haven't emphasized yet. The, the idea of doing this uh, is relatively new compared to, to a lot of other applications of data assimilation. So it's, it's a, uh, people doing data assimilation with the geodynamo model. It's a, it's a small, uh, young community. Um, so the, the first proof of concept studies showed up just 14 years ago. Uh, and most of these, of these three, actually two of them, uh, just use uh, very simplified one dimensional proxy models of the geodynamo. Um, and then one used a, a dynamo model, but with uh, just synthetic data experiments. Uh, and then shortly after that, uh, you start, you started seeing data assimilation experiments, but uh, with simplified versions of the dynamo. So uh, models using steady flow in the core and, and things like that. And then in 2010, that's when you, you first get a prediction of secular variation, the, the variation of the magnetic field using one of these systems where uh, the dynamic model, the assimilation system was a, was a full self-consistent 3D dynamo model like we, we discussed. So, so this was in 2010 and that uh, prediction was actually used, you remember I, I showed the, uh, a plot earlier from the International Geomagnetic Reference Field. I can't remember if I, I said at the time, this is something, you know, they, they release these every five years. Uh, and so it includes not just a map of the, the, the present field and the recent field, but also a projection of the future. Actually, it just, what, what, they, what they give is a, a, the average change in, the, in those spherical harmonic coefficients, so an average rate of change in, in the large scale features of the field uh, for the coming five years. So you can, you can do a, a linear extrapolation uh, with, what they, with what they provide. And so uh, the, the way it works is there's an international panel of scientists that get together and then people submit their projections or estimates of the, of the recent field. And uh, they, they come up with some weighted, weighted combination of those, of those um, submissions. Okay, so this was just 10 years ago then. This was the first time they, they used one of these things and in the, included it in the prediction of, of secular variation. Uh, and then since then, uh, several groups have popped up uh, around the globe doing, doing the same sort of thing. Uh, I mean, several here is relative as something on the order of, of 10, uh, maybe groups in, in different places that are doing data assimilation with geodynamo models. Uh, and so now we've gotten to the point where the most recent IGRF, so, so this release, this is from the most, uh, this is from the most recent release. This is their predicted secular variation. This is the predicted change actually in declination uh, in units of degrees per year for the coming five years. Uh, this includes contributions from several, several of these geomagnetic DA systems now. Um, and they do use a variety. Several of them use dynamo models. There are also people using other uh, simplified versions of dynamo models or some some physics based models but with, with some simplifications and you can see you can see actually in this in this map right here you know it's not um you know it's not a negligible amount of change over five years for example down uh, our friends in south america can expect uh you know over the next five years to see something like a, a degree change uh in declination <clears throat> so it's something you could 
if you were careful in the right conditions, you could you could measure yourself. All right, so here's uh, here's our first depiction of one of these forecasts. So uh, the NASA system, as I said before, is an ensemble Kalman filter based system. Uh, they call it the, the Geomagnetic Ensemble Modeling System, or GEMS. NASA really likes acronyms. Uh, and on the top here, uh, this, what I'm showing the top row is just observations. So this is for back uh, from 2010 to 2015, you have the, the average radial component of the field over that time. And this is down at the core. So this is downward continued to the core mantle boundary. Uh, and the average change in intensity in units of nano Tesla per year over that same period of time, right? And then down on the bottom, <clears throat> you have the forecasts produced by pr produced by gems for these these values. <clears throat> and one thing I haven't uh, said yet, when we've been looking at these plots uh, of the field down at the core mantle boundary, uh, which you can you can see here, is that uh, of course you see it's still Largely, you see the signal of the dipole field, right? The field coming out in one hemisphere and back in and, and the other. But you, you can see down at the core mantle boundary, you actually have these reverse flux patches here uh, in the southern end of, of South America and, and off the southern coast of, of Africa. And these are things you don't, you don't see these uh, at the surface, of course, but you, see, uh, you do see the, the South Atlantic anomaly in, in this region here. All right, to, to give you a better picture of, of what this is doing over time, uh, I'll show you assimilations from the system. Uh, this, this is gonna be a video, I'll start here in a second. And what this is gonna show you is actually the, the observed magnetic field uh, over the last, well, the radial component uh, of the magnetic field over the last 400 years. And then the forecasts uh, of the radial component uh, as it assimilates these observations. And it's doing assimilations every, every 20 years, okay? So that's why on, on the right in the forecast one, you'll see, you, you see this periodic jerking then in the forecast as it assimilates observations uh, to, to keep it on, on track. And this is also, this is also with the uh, this is with the dipole contribution removed here. Okay, so that's why you don't you don't see that if if we just showed the dipole, it would conceal a lot of these these finer scale features that are in the in the observations and the forecast. So that's just taken out for the sake of clarity. Okay, so uh, as I said, there there are now several other. Uh, DA system using these dynamo models, and a lot of them use ENKFs. Uh, just recently, so ENKFs, for example, I'll talk about this actually, this system a little bit more in a bit. Uh, this one uh, has been described in a couple of papers by Sabrina Sanchez. Um, and then recently, for the first time, uh, a hybrid variational scheme was used. Uh, this is a group in, in Japan. And in fact, both of these systems are also. Uh, these, these are two of the, the contributors to the, to the recent IGRF release. Okay, so uh, some of the contributions to, to the IGRF forecasts uh, that don't use geodynamo models, maybe they use physics-based models, um, um, or some of them use uh, just actually mathematical methods just for to do some some extrapolation um, uh, the, you know they can they can work fairly well but what makes doing the the dynamo assimilations interesting now is that is that you get estimates of of all these physical features of, of the dynamo that otherwise go unobserved so for example you get these estimates of the the core flow and the magnetic field in the interior and so this is actually a nice picture uh, from this Sabrina Sanchez paper uh, where they're showing the, after their last assimilation, before they did their forecast in 2020, you see the instantaneous variation in the intensity 
of the radial component of the field. That's what the coloring is. And then these, these vectors are the core flow, the horizontal core flow at the surface of the core mantle boundary. And the shading indicates the, the velocity. So it goes from uh, the light, light shades, it says are five kilometers a year up to uh, 40 kilometers a year for these, these dark ones. And so, so that's pretty typical. It's thought something on the order of like 10 kilometers a year, a year is a, is a typical uh, velocity in the fluid of the outer core. Okay, and so you can see uh, you have this, this pretty complicated looking flow pattern at, at the core mantle boundary. Uh, and, you know, you can say, well, that's, that's great, but, you know, you just spent all this time telling me that, you know, all this, all of this system goes unobserved. So how, how do you even know, how do you evaluate this? How do you know how well you're doing? And you've really got a couple of ways to get a grasp on, uh, on how well you're doing at predicting these, these unobserved features like the core flow. Uh, the first one is of course, observing system simulation experiments. So uh, I know this has been mentioned a couple of times over the last week and a half, but just as a reminder, right? The idea would be that I could take, I could take my Dynamo model, run it for a while, record that run, uh, and then take the things that I can actually observe, like the the magnetic field, and maybe add a little noise to those, and then try and use my simulation system to reconstruct the the model run I just did, and then I have a true, quote, true uh, velocity field and things like that to compare with. And so a lot of the, uh, a lot of the experiments, a lot of the numerical experiments with these assimilation systems over the last 10 years have, uh, for obvious reasons, involved doing these observing system simulation experiments. And then, of course, the, the ultimate, uh, the ultimate way to evaluate how well you're doing or to, to suggest how well you might be doing it at estimating these unobserved quantities is to just look at your success in forecasting future changes. All right, so uh, the observing system simulation experiments uh, have, have shown that given enough, enough data and the right conditions, uh, you are getting you are getting uh, much improved estimates of the core flow, particularly at the, at the boundary, but also over time uh, below the, the core mantle boundary, even tens of kilometers uh, into, the, into the outer core. Uh, and, then, and then forecasts um, show improvement with the, with the assimilation of these magnetic field observations. And uh, in fact, continue to show continue to show improvement up to the present day as we, as we get more and more uh, uh, observations available, the magnetic field, uh, the forecasts are getting better. I'll talk about that in a, in a bit. Uh, so, so one of the nice things then about having this dynamic model and this estimate of the whole state of the system is that you can go ahead and, and run it forward and try and make a projection uh, further than say five years out, like the IGRF uh, models. And so this is uh, again from that Sabrina Sanchez paper. They they went ahead and made their their predictions for the secular variation over five years, and then went ahead and ran their model out uh, fifty years into the future to to 2070. And so up here at the top, this is just a depiction of their estimate of the of the uh, geomagnetic poles. Uh, in blue and the, and the dip poles here in red. So the geomagnetic pole, the, it's just, if you approximate the field by a, by a dipole uh, versus with the dip poles, this, is, this would just be where they predict the field will be vertical at the, at the surface of the earth. And down here, this is their prediction for the South Atlantic anomaly. So of course, from 1970 up until 2020, you're looking at, at observations. And then from there forward, that's their, their prediction. And so uh, something I didn't mention earlier, uh, but one of the changes that's seen, been seen in the magnetic field for a while is, is there's a general westward drift, the structure of the field. Uh, and so, so you see things like the South Atlantic anomaly uh, slowly drifting, drifting to the west over time. And so in their projections, they, they predict that to, to continue. And actually this, the, the coloring here indicates the intensity um, 
with the, with the darker purple being lower intensity level. So they're predicting, and this is in general agreement with other projections like this, that, that the South Atlantic anomaly is gonna to continue to, to drift west and, and weaken further. Okay, so those are some of the results we're getting. Uh, but as I said, this is, a, uh, this is a relatively new application of data assimilation. And it's a relatively small community of people working on it. And so there are still a lot of, a lot of challenges that have to be addressed. And so I want to just go over what, what some of those are and maybe the way we're, uh, we're thinking about how to deal with them. So of course, as we've already said, uh, you know, we, this is a very sparsely observed system. You just have these spherical harmonics describing the magnetic field near the core mantle boundary. Uh, when you, I alluded to this earlier, when you use these sequential assimilation systems like uh, the ENKF system at NASA or, or the, the system that uh, the group with Sabrina Sanchez is using, uh, what you see is that the forecasts at the present day improve uh, if you go back uh, even hundreds of years in the past and start assimilating observations, okay? So we could do with more data. The problem is when you look into the past, uh, of course, the, the temporal and spatial resolution of the data isn't as good as for the last two decades where we have satellite-based measurements. Okay, so to, to illustrate that point, uh, this video shows the radial magnetic field observations of the radial magnetic field over the last 2000 years. And of course, far back in time, you only have those low degree spherical harmonics. You can only reconstruct what the large scale field looked like. So there's this counter up at the top of the video that's uh, counting up. I don't know if people could see it, but you'll see when this reaches 1600, we'll get into the historical record. Uh, and suddenly you'll see, there it is, the increase in, increase in resolution. And so uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting at here is that uh, we know, it seems already that we, we know with the systems that are already in place now, uh, as things operate now, we would be able to do better with our forecasts and estimates of the state if we just had 100 years of satellite-based observations, right? Because this is, a, this is a dynamically a slow system compared to say something like the weather um, so when you use one of these sequential assimilation systems like an ENKF, typically you have a so-called spin-out period, right? So this, this plot over here is an illustration, actually not from a geodynamo model, but a, a proxy for the geodynamo um, that we use to, to investigate some issues related to geomagnetic DA. But uh, the important thing is this, these are forecast errors using an ENKF for a synthetic data experiment over time as you do more and more assimilations. And so what, what I'm saying is with the, with the real model and the real observations, we're stuck right now. We're still somewhere on this, on this error curve where we're headed down with our forecast errors, right? So, you, so with the ensemble assimilation system, the idea is you, you keep assimilating observations and your collection of simulations uh, sort of hones in over time on the, on the true state of the system. And we just don't have enough high resolution data uh, going far enough back in time, uh, possibly, to really, to really fully spin this thing up, spin the, the filter up and do it as good as we possibly can at estimating the state and making forecasts. So that's one issue. Uh, another one is that these geodynamo models are are run in parameter regimes that really don't match uh, those of the earth. And so you have systematic biases in the, in the forecasts. <clears throat> so as an example, I'll talk about uh, the magnetic Rossby number really quick and the, the Ekman number. Okay, so these are just, these, these are just non-dimensional parameters that represent the ratio of the magnetic effects to the rotation effects in the case of the magnetic Rossby number or in the Ekman number case, uh, fluid viscosity 
uh, relative to, to rotation effects. And so in the current simulations, uh, for example, used by the, the Dynamo model at NASA, these are on the order of 10 to the negative six. Uh, in reality, the Earth uh, actually is, is much different. Uh, in particular, you see this, the, the Ekman number here is off by something like nine orders of magnitude. And so this is, this is usually the point at which people that aren't familiar with this problem you know, spit out their coffee and, and, and choke a little because this, this looks pretty, I mean, this, this looks like a huge problem. And it, it is a problem, but I'll, I'll explain in a second why you can get away with getting interesting results uh, regardless. So the reason for this is just purely computational. Uh, this is probably a, a problem that, that a lot of other people uh, on this, uh, in this talk have. Uh, in their own in their own models, right? You just you simply can't you can't resolve things when you use these these parameter values, not with the, the computational resources you have, right? So the the spatial and temporal resolution, right, are going to be proportional to these parameters. If you try and bring down the Ekman number, right, to lower values, you're really you're really uh, effectively making viscosity fluid viscosity very small. You start getting a lot of a lot of turbulence and fine scale features in the flow that becomes really difficult to resolve, and uh, and and we're just we're just not there yet with these Dynamo models. All right, uh, the reason that um, the reason that you can still get some interesting results though is that even in these parameter regimes. These dynamo models make magnetic fields that, that look like the Earth in a lot of important ways. Okay, so people like to use the phrase Earth-like. Some people, some people really don't like that phrase, uh, but, but you see it a lot in, in the discussion of this topic. And so this is, the, this is uh, a figure from uh, the, the paper people always point to in this discussion, this Christensen uh, 2010 paper. And uh, what it's showing is these, these different shape symbols are just dynamo simulations with different Ekman numbers. And then the horizontal axis is actually another parameter called the magnetic Ekman number. And the vertical axis is the magnetic Reynolds number. Uh, but the point is uh, that the shading tries to tell you something about how, how Earth-like the simulation is in terms of, you know, does it have a, a dipole dominated field? And, and what sort of time scales does that field vary on compared to the rest of the field? Okay, so there's anyway there's been a there's been a, a fair amount of work done in in identifying places in the parameter space where you get stuff where you have a nice dipole dominated field like the Earth, and it varies in similar ways uh, as 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 the Earth. But there's still this still has some major issues, right? So you have this non-dimensional model of the geodynamo. Uh, how do you, and then you have these observations you want to assimilate into it. How do you relate things in your model to, to the observations, right? What's, for example, what's a time step in your, in your model now? You know, what's one year in your model? Uh, you don't know, you have, to, you have to make some sort of choice. Uh, and it varies a lot depending on what kinds of parameters you pick. So this is just a collection of dynamo simulations using different magnetic Rossby numbers. And then on the vertical axis, you have the typical time scale of the dipole, time scale of variations in the dipole. And on the horizontal axis, you have the typical dipole intensity. And these are, these are log scales here. So you, know, you change the magnetic Rossby number, you get uh, different, different time scales for variations in the dipole, very different intensities. You have to make some choice about what your you know, what your time step actually represents in geophysical time if you're going to assimilate observations. And you have to decide how to scale magnetic field intensity uh, to assimilate your observations. And so, so this is an area where it's, it's still not quite clear what the, what the optimal choices are. And then even at these, even with these uh, generous parameter values, uh, the models, as I said before, are still are still very expensive. So this is this plot's trying to show the number of floating point operations you'd need for 
a simulation over a single magnetic free decay time. Uh, as, and this is as a function of the inverse magnetic Rossby number. So, so here's where we're at now. And the main thing to get out of this is uh, if you move over to an Earth-like value, you're increasing the number of floating point operations, you're increasing, increasing your computational expense by a factor of uh, four, or not a factor of four, four orders of magnitude. Okay, so, uh, you know, we're just, again, we're just not close to being able to simulate in the, the true parameter regime of, of the Earth. And the consequence of this when it comes to, to running data assimilation, in particular ensemble-based data assimilation, is that the ensemble sizes you can run with are limited, right? You'd like to run an ensemble-based DA system. You'd ideally like to run as many as many simultaneous simulations as possible. But uh, for the most part, people run, run these systems with only a few hundred ensemble members. But the dimension of the state space, so the length of that vector X that describes the full state of the, of the dynamo model <clears throat> is typically, typically in the millions, okay? And so what that means is that you end up with uh, a lot of sampling error when you go to compute the statistics from the ensemble, right? So this goes back to the discussion of the ensemble Coleman filter algorithm, right? You take your ensemble and you and you look at how things are correlated in your in your forecast. Uh, when you have that few uh, ensemble members compared to the dimension of the state space, by random chance, uh, almost almost certainly you're going to end up saying that that two parts of the state space are, are correlated uh, just by accident, by sampling error, when in fact they, they shouldn't be, okay? And so, so this is a major issue. Uh, now, fortunately, <clears throat> this is something that I think uh, probably other people who, who do things like numerical weather prediction with ensemble algorithms are, are familiar with, and they've found the numerical weather prediction people uh, you know, have some, some good ways of, of dealing with this. Uh, and a big one is called localization. So the idea of localization is you, you wanna knock out these spurious correlations that might pop up because you're using a, a small ensemble. And for example, uh, covariance localization, you would accomplish this by, by taking your ensemble covariance, right, from your simulations, that P, and then multiplying it uh, Element-wise, multiplying each of those covariances by some fixed factor between between zero and one, right? and that's usually done uh, in a in a spatial context. Right, so the idea would would be, for example, I've uh, showed a illustrate a Gaussian decay of correlations centered on on me right now out here in, in Southern California. And the idea would be if I had some if you have a weather model, right? and you have uh, covariance between temperature, say down here in San Diego where I am and just up the coastline in Los Angeles, uh, you would let correlations that show up in your ensemble between those two variables stick around. You would multiply them by a factor of one or maybe 0.9 or something like that. Uh, on the other hand, if I'm uh, well across the border and into Mexico down here, I'm looking at temperature and my ensemble tells me uh, that it's highly correlated with, with temperature up here in, in San Diego, you might not wanna trust that. You might think that that's just, a, that's just a, a sampling error. And because these things are far apart, they shouldn't be instantaneously uh, correlated in that way. Right, so that's usually the motivation for localization. And that's, I mean, that's where it gets its name from, localization. Uh, you only allow parts of the state to, to interact locally. Uh, but the issue is that's not going to work for us. So this is uh, the reason that I've emphasized in the first half of the talk that the observations of the magnetic field and the description of the state are all in spherical harmonics, right? So this, this covariance here for us, this P is telling us about correlations between spherical harmonic coefficients. And so they don't have a particular location in space associated with them. There's not really a measure of a physical distance between them. 
So there's this question of how do we identify in this problem with the geodynamo uh, spurious correlations? Okay. Uh, you know, another way this sampling error stuff is, is dealt with, uh, not the issue of spurious correlations, um, but an issue where you start underestimating uncertainty uh, because you have a small ensemble, right? You might, the ensemble members might start to uh, become very close together and you become overconfident in your, in your forecasts. Um, you know, you don't have enough ensemble members going to really give you an idea of the level of variability in your estimates. And so people use um, techniques called inflation a lot of times to deal with that issue. And that's, that's not a, that's not really a, a problem here. You don't need some measure of, of uh, uh, length or a notion of, of, of distance to do this. This is a lot of times, this is just accomplished by right before you do an assimilation, you take your ensemble members and you, you push them away from the mean a little bit by a, by a certain factor. Okay, so this, this is a big unknown and uh, how to do something like localization. And only recently, uh, have some people started to really think about these things. Uh, and so in particular, um, so the Sabrina Sanchez group has, has started doing something like this. So this is, if, if you can't tell, I really like this, this uh, 2020 paper of theirs. It's, it's really nice and has, it has a lot of nice uh, figures in it. So I've, I've borrowed a lot of those. Um, so what they did is they went and computed, they, they made a really long run of their dynamo model. And then they looked at the long-term correlations in that run. And that's what they're showing us here. So this is actually uh, on the horizontal axis. These are coefficients for the poloidal magnetic field at the core mantle boundary. And on the horizontal axis, you have the coefficients describing the poloidal velocity field, the flow of the fluid. And these are the long-term, or you might call them climatological correlations in the system, okay? And so certainly for a lot of these, uh, so there's, there's this color scale here that gives you what the, what the correlations are. And so white is, is zero. So you see a lot of these over a long time are, are uncorrelated, but then there's this clear structure in here. And in fact, they, they zoom in and show us it's uh, what they describe as a, a checkerboard pattern, right? And so they decided to go ahead and use some different variations uh, on this, this checkerboard pattern. So they're showing what their localization matrix might look like here. So the idea is it's just made up of, of ones, and, ones and zeros, right? So for, for spherical harmonics that seem to be correlated over long runs, uh, when you're doing the assimilations, and your ensemble indicates a correlation there, you go ahead and just leave it intact. Don't mess with it. Uh, if a correlation pops up in your ensemble for uh, between two spherical harmonics that don't seem to be correlated over a long run, then you zero it out, okay? And then over here on the right, I'm just showing from their, from their paper the um, experiments they did with different ensemble sizes and different variations on this localization scheme. Uh, and this is just the uncertainty in their forecasts and the error in their forecasts. And so the, the main point is, is they, they were able to uh, get the same sort of results uh, at a reduced ensemble size when they, when they employed this sort of localization scheme. And as I said, these, these models are expensive. It's a big, it's a big deal because now they can run uh, they can run more assimilation experiments. Uh, I also think, I also just like this plot here because I think it's neat. You can see they're assimilating from observations from sometime back in the 1800s uh, up to present day. And you can see, I think they're, they're doing this every five years in here, they're assimilating observations. And then you can see when you get to the satellite era and they start assimilating, uh, assimilating observations every year and you can see this, this sudden drop right here. So you can sort of see that, you know, we, we can be envious of people in a hundred years that have, that have a century worth of satellite observations because, you know, who, who knows where this curve will, will be uh, by then if you assimilate all this stuff. Okay, so uh, unfortunately, one of the issues uh, 
with exploring techniques for localization and inflation is that what you'd like to do is just run a bunch of experiments with the system to see what works well. Uh, but as I've already said, these things are really expensive and I'm sure that uh, this was no small task. I don't know exactly what kind of computing resources they have, but I'm, I'm sure this, these experiments on their own um, uh, are not something that they just did in a matter of days. I'm sure, I'm sure it took a while. Uh, <clears throat> so in other applications of data assimilation, uh, people have used proxy models, you might call them, to, to prototype strategies, assimilation strategies for their problems like localization and, and inflation. And in fact, uh, I mentioned before these first proof of concept studies from 14 years ago uh, involved really simple 1D models uh, that were supposed to reflect some of the properties of, of the dynamo problem and assimilating uh, observations into the dynamo. Um, these, are, these are fairly simple models that don't exhibit chaotic behavior though, and, and the dynamo is, is a, a very chaotic system. And then uh, recently we developed uh, a proxy model that's two-dimensional and you have a, a chaotic flow in 2D that's coupled to a 2D magnetic field through that induction equation and uh, in turn the, the magnetic field influences the, the velocity field through the Lorentz force. Uh, and both the magnetic field and the velocity field are described then by a, by a scalar. That's actually what's in the coloring in the video. And so then the idea is uh, just like with the observations of the dynamo, we can describe the, the state of this model uh, just by the scalar field. And so, for example, on the surface of sphere, uh, we can describe the state of the model using spherical harmonics. And then we can, we can do synthetic data experiments where we see well, how well can we reconstruct this 2D flow uh, if we only know about large scale spherical harmonics describing the magnetic field. Okay, and so that, that lets us go ahead and uh, run a bunch of numerical, we can run thousands of numerical experiments then with that system because it's, it's much simpler computationally than the dynamo. But of course, I mean, you're, you're giving up a lot of, a lot of uh, stuff by doing that. Um, but the idea is you can run a bunch of experiments. Uh, and for example, this is a collection of forecast error plots in these synthetic data experiments as a function of ensemble size for various ensemble Kalman filters where we've, we've modified them with different localization and inflation schemes. And, and you can see a, a variety of, of uh, responses to, to the, the implementation of those schemes. Uh, maybe the most important thing though, is that it let us run uh, a large ensemble, a large enough ensemble uh, that you can be confident in the ensemble statistics that you're getting, right? You can run an ensemble that's, that's larger than the, much larger than the dimension of the, of the system, right? And so actually what I'm showing down here is uh, in this proxy model, a correlation coefficient uh, in the forecast ensemble over time between two modes that climatologically are, are uncorrelated. So over the course of a long run, uh, these modes are, are completely uncorrelated. But uh, that's not the case in the forecast ensemble, the really large forecast ensemble. Uh, and it turns out that's because you know, over the short term, if you start looking at correlations between these modes, uh, over, the, over these short-term forecasts, uh, the forecast error can be correlated, right? You have a collection of ensemble members that starts from a very similar state, and then uh, the energy can be shared between these different modes, these different spherical harmonics in, in complicated ways. And so you get a really complicated correlation structure for these short-term forecasts that doesn't, doesn't necessarily show up and the climatological statistics. So what I'm getting at is, for example, if you look back at the, the dynamo model correlations, uh, one of the issues uh, we may be having is that you know, look at the climatological correlations and you, you want to zero out uh, some of these correlations, some of these uh, covariances in here in your forecast ensemble. 
uh, because they don't seem to be correlated climatologically. But that may not actually be what you want to do. It may be that in these short-term forecasts that you're using in the assimilation system, uh, these, these things should be, should be correlated. All right, so uh, now I just want to sort of <clears throat> wrap up what we just talked about and maybe describe uh, sort of where I think things might be headed or some of the some of the directions that things are heading in. So what we talked about was the, the so-called main magnetic field or the core field of the planet, right? And that's the field generated uh, by the convective flow in the outer core or the geodynamo. And uh, we had this issue, or we have this issue, right, where the magnetic field measurements reflect the influence of a lot of different sources, not just the geodynamo that we're interested in. <clears throat> and then because of that, we, <clears throat> we had to rely on these uh, geomagnetic field models people build from the observations that describe a potential for the field in spherical harmonics. We had to do this spherical harmonic business, right, to isolate the large scale features of the field that we believe are coming from the geodynamo. And this is actually uh, just an illustration I didn't get a chance to include on earlier slides. <clears throat> this is the observed field up at the top in 2015. The coloring is the intensity and you have some uh, level curves around that South Atlantic anomaly. And again, this is another illustration of when you, when you downward continue this to the core mantle boundary, uh, you see a much more a much more complicated structure. You can see the same contour lines here for the South Atlantic anomaly. Uh, things get get much more messy. Okay. <clears throat> and then, as we just discussed, um, this whole issue of doing things in spherical harmonics is important because uh, we're limited to small ensemble sizes uh, from the computational expense of the of the system. And normally you might fall back on something like localization. Uh, in fact, uh, it's something that uh, in large systems with ensemble common filters, I think it's, it's generally ag agreed on that you need to do something like this if, you, if you're using small ensembles. Um, but the spherical harmonics make that uh, a real challenge. It's, it's still not clear exactly how to do that. So how to control for spurious correlations popping up in our, our forecast ensemble. And then the other issue that we talked about is that the parameters in these dynamo models just aren't right. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't match the, the parameter values for the earth. And so we have these systematic biases in, in the forecasts. And it's also not certain what the optimal way is to, to rescale things to, to match the observations. So uh, going forward, uh, with these ensemble-based assimilation systems, uh, we're going to have to keep finding ways to keep the necessary ensemble size low, um, trying to find ways to do localization like the Sabrina Sanchez's group has done. Uh, and in particular, you know, you can, you can say that, well, we'll, you know, hopefully we'll get more computing power uh, and then maybe you can run a bigger ensemble. But because of these issues with the parameters, uh, you know, you'd also like to, if you get more computing power, you'd also like to push the, the dynamo models closer to the true parameter values of the earth. So even if we get more computing power, right, you, you, you want to give it, you want to give it back right away <clears throat> by increasing the resolution of your, of your dynamo model. Uh, <clears throat> uh, probably a, a lot more experiments need to be run to understand uh, how, how we're scaling these things. Uh, as, as I've said, it's just it, because of the expense of these systems, it's, it's difficult to do all of the experiments that you might want to do to learn about the best possible scalings for, for forecasts. And I think there's also this question of, are there approaches, you know, I spent a lot of time here describing how you do all this stuff in spherical harmonics uh, to isolate the signal in the dynamo, but, you know, are there, are there other ways to go about this or are there other things that could maybe be modeled so that it's okay to assimilate direct observations of the magnetic field instead of doing a spherical harmonic stuff? You know, if you could do that, then it would, it would let you uh, do things like localization uh, more easily. Um, 
but uh, I, you know, in there, I think there, there's some people actively uh, thinking about this. You know, it's also possible, one thing that's been in the discussion since uh, this first started a little over 10 years ago is what other observations besides the magnetic field might be used to constrain the, the geodynamo system. And um, one of them is, is decadal scale length of day variations. It's, it's known that uh, decadal uh, scale changes in length of day are, are associated with changes in, in the fluid flow and the rotational, the angular momentum of the outer core. And so there's this idea that could you use that to somehow constrain the fluid flow? Uh, and similarly, uh, decadal scale changes in, in uh, uh, decadal scale polar motion has also been seen to be uh, correlated with changes in the angular momentum in the outer core. Uh, so the issue with both of these things is that it's still, this would be some sort of uh, integral over the, over the core, this, this observation, right, represents a, a cumulative effect. And so, uh, you know, just like with the magnetic observations, uh, this sort of global, in a sense, that it would be associated with a particular location in space. Uh, and then the other thing I just, I wanna mention is I focused here on, on assimilations with geodynamo models, but in terms of producing forecasts, uh, there, there are other possibilities. Uh, in particular, uh, there's this model um, discussed in this Barron Zone paper from 2020. And in fact, this was another uh, contributor to the IGRF release that just happened. And they use a statistical model uh, and they model a variety of sources, not just the geodynamo, but the, but the other sources that we talked about so corrupting the, the signal or showing up in, a, in magnetic field measurements. And so because they go ahead and model those things, uh, they assimilate, they go ahead and assimilate raw observations into, the, into their model. So they don't have to do this, this business with the spherical harmonics. And that seems like it could be a pretty, a pretty promising thing. And I think with that, I'm, I'm out of time and I'm at the end here, so I'll, I'll stop. Okay, thank you very much, Keith.